Welcome. This tutorial discusses another important measure that describes data, the shape of the distribution. Data can be distributed symmetrically, where the low and high values balance each other out, or skewed, where there is an imbalance of high numbers and low values. Let's take a look at this graph, which shows a symmetrical distribution. The middle of this mound or bell-shaped curve is where most of the data are. To the right and to the left are fewer and fewer data values, and so the distribution is balanced on both sides. This type of distribution is considered symmetrical, and the mean is equal to the median in this type of a distribution. There is zero skew in a symmetrical distribution. Here is another graph that shows a skewed distribution. The tail is pulling out to the left, so this is called a negative or left skewed distribution. The tail on the left shows that there are extremely low values on the left, and those low values are pulling the mean down. Imagine a group of test grades where most people score between a 70 and 100, but there is one test score at the extremely low end, let's say a 20. What will that extremely low grade do to the average for the class? It will pull the average or the mean down. So when we have a negative or left skewed distribution, the mean will be lower or less than the median. Now let's look at a distribution where the tail is out to the right. This is called a positive or a right skewed distribution. The tail is out to the right because there are a few extremely high values, but most of the data is down on the left. Imagine a neighborhood with most home prices between $150,000 and $200,000. Now let's say there's one home that was built by someone in the neighborhood who became wealthy and didn't want to move. So they built a $30 million mansion. Their $30 million mansion will pull the tail out to the right, causing a positive skew to the data. And what do you suppose it does to the mean? It will pull the mean up so that the mean will be greater than the median. When a data set has one or a few observations with extreme values that skew the distribution, these extreme values are called outliers. It is important to examine outliers to determine if these were errors in the data collection process and the observations were incorrectly recorded, or if this is a true value but an unusual one. The statistician or researcher must then decide whether to keep the extreme value or to throw it out. If the value is a correct value, but the researcher decides to throw it out because it skews the distribution, then he can do so, but he is ethically bound to report the value that was discarded and the reason why. You can't just throw out numbers you don't like without making a note of it and explaining your reasoning. The next topic we need to cover is z-scores. Z-scores give us a measure of relative location so that we can determine how far any individual value is from the mean. Because it is a relative measurement, we can use it no matter what the units are for the original data. The formula for calculating a z-score is z subscript i is equal to x subscript i minus x bar divided by s, where z subscript i is the z-score for x subscript i, and x bar is the sample mean, and s is the sample standard deviation. So to calculate the z-score for any value, all we need is x bar and s the sample standard deviation. The z score can be calculated from any unit of measurement and it results in what is called a standardized value. This means that we can compare different units of measurement whether they are in dollars, ounces, or points scored on an exam. This way the values from two different data sets with the same z scores can have the same relative location as measured in standardized units from the mean. Here we have an example of two data sets, grades from a class of day students and grades from a class of night students. X bar for both of these classes is calculated at 80, so the mean is the same for both. On the other hand, the standard deviation is very different, with S calculated as 3.16 for the day students and 15.81 for the night students. To calculate the z-scores for our grade data, we can make a column of x scores. We have 76, 78, 80, 82, and 84. And then in the second column, we put the mean x bar for the grades, which is 80 all the way down. And then the third column, we write out the deviations about the mean, x subscript i minus x bar. The fourth column, we would then calculate the z-score by taking the numbers in the third column and dividing them by s 
the sample standard deviation. This gives us a standardized z-score for every x-score value. So again, take a look one more time. Column 1, you have the x sub i's. Those are the original five grades. Column 2, you have x bar, that's 80. Column 3 are the deviations about the mean, so each number from the first column, 76 minus 80 is minus 4, and so on. And then in the fourth column, we take the numerator, x sub i minus x bar, and we divide by s. s is 3.16, that's the sample standard deviation, and we get all of the z-scores. So when x sub i is a 76, a grade on the exam is 76, the z-score for that would be minus 1.2658, and so on. Let's see what the z-scores look like on a graph. Here's a graph of the original data. We have the grades 76, 78, 80, 82, and 84, and we see that 80 is in the middle, and it is the mean grade, right? Now let's look at the converted scores. Here is the fourth column from the previous slide on the left, where we calculated a z of 1, minus 1.265 for the x score of 76, and for the x score of 78 we got minus 0.6328 and so on. Remember, using the z-score formula, we took every x-score, subtracted from the mean, and divided by s to convert it to a z-score and to get this column of numbers. Each of these numbers corresponds to the original grade data. So an x-grade in the original unit of 76 is converted to a z-score in a standardized unit of minus 1.2658. Now let's take away the x-scores from the graph and replace them with the new standardized z-scores. You see the grades still remain in the original positions. The data has not changed, only the scale that we are using has changed. Remember the mean x-score was 80? What is the corresponding mean z-score? It is 0. The mean will always be 0 on the z-scale. Remember that, it's a very important concept. The mean on the z-scale will always be 0. So if the mean will always be 0, then the numbers to the left of it will always be negative, and the numbers to the right will always be positive. It's important you understand this concept of converting x-scores to z-scores. In statistics, we will mostly be using z-scores to evaluate data, not x-scores. This is so we can compare data sets easily no matter what the underlying original units of the data are. Once they are standardized to z-scores, they can be compared and analyzed easily. Because this is so important, let's take a look at the formula for converting x-scores to z-scores one more time. Here is the formula we used. z is calculated by taking each x subscript i so that those original grades are subtracted from the mean x-bar and divided by s, the sample standard deviation. And using this formula, we calculated a corresponding z-score for any x-score we want to look at. And one last point that needs to be repeated, the mean for the new standardized values will always be 0, and the numbers to the left of the mean will always be negative, the numbers to the right will always be positive. And so that brings us to a very important theorem in statistics called Chebyshev's theorem. The theorem tells us the proportion of data values that must be within a specified number of standard deviations from the mean. So for example, let's say we have a mean of 80 and a sample standard deviation of 3. I know it was 3.16 for our previous example, but let's use the number 3 to make it easier to illustrate. Then this theorem tells us the proportion of students who got between 3 points below the mean and 3 points above the mean. That is one standard deviation. So if the mean is 80, this theorem tells us the proportion of students who got between a 77 and an 83. 80 minus 3 is 77, 80 plus 3 is 83. That is plus and minus the standard deviation of 3 points. Using this theorem, we come up with something called the empirical rule. This tells us the proportion of data values that must be within a specified number of standard deviations from the mean for a symmetrical or a bell-shaped distribution. Not just any distribution, it must be symmetrical or bell-shaped. It allows us to get more specific proportions if we believe that that data is symmetrical and bell-shaped. Here we can see what a symmetrical bell-shaped or mound-shaped distribution might look like. 
you can see the characteristic bell shape to this curve and you can imagine that most of the data values are in the middle or center of the curve and that's why it peaks there in the center. This type of bell shaped curve is referred to in statistics as a normal distribution. It's a distribution you will come across a lot since many observations in real life tend to be normally distributed with most values in the middle and less and less values as you move away from the mean. Take IQ scores as an example. An IQ of 100 is considered average and most people have an IQ in and around 100. That's just the average person. As you move to the upper end of the IQ scale or the lower end, you get fewer and fewer people in those categories. This is true for home prices in certain neighborhoods, salary data for certain professions, and most types of psychological measurements. So the normal distribution becomes a very important type of distribution since it depicts most data sets. An important characteristic of the normal distribution is that the mean is equal to the median and the mode. They are always equal to each other. The mean is the arithmetic average. The median is the mark where 50% of the values are below and 50% are above. And the mode is the most frequently observed value. And for a normal distribution, this will always be in the center where I'm placing this Greek letter mu. Now remember the z-scale? So what is the mean if this data is standardized to z-scores? And the answer is zero. Remember what I said, the mean is always standardized to a zero when we are using z-scores. So back to the empirical rule. What does the empirical rule say? It says for a normal distribution, approximately 68% of data values will be within one standard deviation of the mean. Approximately 95% of the data values will be within two standard deviations of the mean. And virtually all the data values will be within three standard deviations of the mean. Here is what that looks like graphically. This is a normal distribution curve. I've marked off the points that would be one standard deviation below and above the mean. Now what the empirical rule says is that 68% of the data values will be within one standard deviation of the mean. So let's say we have a class average of 80 and the standard deviation is three points. Then three points below the average would be 77, and three points above the average would be 83. So according to the empirical rule, 68% of the grades in this class are between a 77 and an 83. That is, 68% of the data values are within one standard deviation of the mean. And since a standard deviation is three points, that's between a 77 and an 83. What about two standard deviations from the mean? What does the empirical rule say about that? The empirical rule says that 95% of the data values will be within two standard deviations of the mean. So since the standard deviation is three points, then two standard deviations is six points. So 80 minus six is 74, and 80 plus six is 86. So according to the empirical rule, 95% of the class got between a 74 and an 86. And finally, we need to look at three standard deviations from the mean, which contains virtually all the data. So here we see three standard deviations marked off above and below the mean. For the grade data, a standard deviation was three points. So 80 plus three is 83, plus another three is 86, plus another three gives us 89 as three standard deviations above the mean. We do the same thing for the deviations below the mean, and we get 77, 74, and 71. So what are we saying for this grade data? We are saying that virtually everyone in the class scored between a 71 and an 89 on the exam. Not every distribution that is symmetrical in mound shape looks like this. Some are tall and skinny, some are short and fat. But as long as they are symmetrical with the mean equal to the median equal to the mode, then they are considered normally distributed. Here are some examples of the normal distribution that look different from each other. The tall skinny curves show that the data values are clustered closer to the mean, so the standard deviation is smaller than the short fat curves, which are more spread out, meaning the standard deviations are larger for those curves. If these curves represent grades on an exam, which group of curves would you rather have your class in? The answer should be the right grouping, since the mean for the right grouping, that is the middle of each curve, is higher on the x-axis than the left group. Now assume you would rather be in the cluster on the right, which of these distributions of grades is more spread out or dispersed? 
The answer is the shortest, fattest one has the biggest spread. That's the darker olive green curve with the red arrow. It would have the larger standard deviation, and although the mean is still 80, the range of grades from lowest to highest would be more spread out, and there's more variation in this data. Just try to isolate that short, fat, green olive curve where the red arrow is pointing. You can see how spread out that data is. And which of these curves would have the smallest variation? That would be that higher, taller, skinnier yellow curve. That one. The data values for this curve are most tightly clustered around the mean. So you can see that although the shape for all of these distributions looks the same, bell-shaped and symmetrical, with the mean equal to the median and the mode, they are all telling us a different story. That's it for this tutorial. We have discussed the different distribution shapes and how to standardize data by converting them to z-scores. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, and I hope you learned something.